Hey everyone, glad you can join us for another one of our online services. You know, I was watching a game of hockey recently and I've been loving all the action, but it's just not the same without having people in the stands, people cheering and clapping and screaming, all those things. And I know for many of you it's been the same. You've been enjoying these services at home, but you're longing and wishing you could be with us in person. We want you to know that we miss you too. We want you to know that we love you and we care about you and we desire to be continuing in that community, to mourn with you when you are mourning, and to celebrate the good things that are going on in your life. And so if there's something that we can be doing to be helpful for you, to serve you in any way, shape, or form, please reach out to me at dave at yarmouthwc.com. We want you to know that even though our experience today is online and you're probably in your living room or somewhere else, you are still part of this church family. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We love you. We care about you. We desire to serve you. And uh, we hope you enjoy the service today. Look forward to seeing you soon. It is good to be in church. I am excited for what God has in store for us. We're glad that you're here. Those, let's go. It is good. Oh, it's going to be a fun night. It's going to be fun. Uh, if you're tuning in online, we are so glad that you're with us as well. And, um, you know, we come together and we worship and we want to welcome Jesus into this place. We want to welcome his presence. But as we do that today, we are going to start off with a line that says, come like you want to. Jesus wants to be here. Whether you're here in the room, if you're on your couch or laying in bed on your phone watching this or you're driving, listening to the audio, Jesus wants to be with you right now. His, his thoughts and his plans and his dreams are beyond what we can imagine. Even numerically, the amount of thoughts he has for us is beyond what we can imagine. And the fact that he's eager to be here and meet with you specifically, he has something. I believe he has something for every one of us. So why don't you stand and join us as we worship.
to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Our God brings new from things that are old. Our God renews. He restores. He brings beauty out of ashes. That's who we serve. He is good. He's worthy of our praise.
feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Oh, you're renewing hearts right now. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. join me in prayer. Jesus, we come before you on a song like that, and we are praying that you are making a way, that you are moving, that you are alive, that you are moving in our communities, in our churches, in our families. And part of the deal is that we don't always see it, that we don't always know what you're up to, but God, we have to trust. And it's really easy to trust you when the evidence is clear. It's harder to trust you when we don't see the obvious. We don't see the tangible. We don't see the practical. And so, God, we've, we have to have eyes to see what you're doing and, and where you're moving, Lord. So, God, even through tonight, through the sermon, through what you're up to, Lord, would you just have your way in this place? God, would you fill us and empower us and do your work? And so, God, that when we leave this place, we can be an example and leave an impact on our community so that you get the glory. God, we don't need people talking about our church. We don't need people talking about us. We need people talking about you. So God, we are yours. Do with us as you see fit. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. You may go ahead and have a seat. How are we doing tonight? <clears throat> Some of you came a little revved up. I came revved up too. <laughs> Told you I came revved up. I, I don't know your deal. I'm not much for YouTube rabbit holes. I'm not much for sitting around and kind of going down the rabbit holes. But every once in a while, I can kind of be pulled into the rabbit hole. And for some reason, this is one of my rabbit holes. I'm not much for MMA. I'm not much for UFC. Just doesn't do it for me. But a good boxing match? I don't know. There's just something about it. And, and I was at SIP on, I don't know, Wednesday or Tuesday kind of working on my sermon and getting a few thoughts and writing out some of the things in, in long form that I wanted to share. And the Holy Spirit came upon me. And the Holy Spirit said, YouTube boxing knockouts. I said, Lord, I'll be your humble servant. I will. <laughs> and I'll even call it that I'm working. Because someone stops by my table to talk with me, I'll say, sorry, I'm working on my sermon. You're watching Mike Tyson's greatest knockouts. <laughs> for the Lord. Understand, this is not for me. This is for the Lord. And so I'm, I'm, I'm watching these, these knockout clips. And if you're like, we don't care about boxing, hang tight, you might. And I'm watching these clips of these knockouts, and I cannot tell you why, but I had the urge to Google cocky boxers. I, try, I believe it's the Holy Spirit. And so I'm watching this fight where these two guys are 10 and 0, one guy's from France and one guy's from the UK. They're like middleweights. And if you know anything about boxing, middleweights are kind of fun because they're fast and can still drop a punch. 
heavyweights are looking for the home run swing every time, but they don't throw very many. And the, like the lightweights, they're just kind of jabbing and, and popping their whole way through, and it usually ends in a decision. But the middleweights, you get the fast and the fury. And so I'm watching this guy from the UK and watching this guy from France, both 10-0, and, and, and they're kind of doing their thing. And I don't know what you know about boxing, but this is where you start. Like, you want your hands up. And so these two guys, if you watch boxing, they're kind of feeling each other out. Just jab, jab, jab. They got their hands up and jab, jab, jab. And all of a sudden, Buddy lands a blow on the one guy, and he goes back. He's not been knocked down his entire career. He hits the mat. And as they're kind of going through it, he gets up, and they're kind of going another round or two, and then bang, another shot, and Buddy gets all woozy in the legs, and he starts to go down. They get down to the last two rounds, and the guy who's landing the shots is starting to feel good about himself because the other guy is getting woozy. You can tell he's like sagging. If you watch boxing, you'll see them. They'll start to droop. And all of a sudden, Buddy, who's ahead, gets real cocky. I mean, like, really cocky. And all of a sudden, he's doing this. He's walking around the ring. He's walking around. And every once in a while, he'll go to Buddy, like, come on. Take your best shot. Take your best shot. He's kind of doing his thing. And at one point, you know, he, he slips in. He pops Buddy. And the guy gets, he almost goes down. And the guy who slipped the punch goes like, ooh, you're getting all woozy. <laughs> like he's just going on and on and on. And at the climax, in like the last round, Buddy slides him another pop. And he's got this match. And he just drops his gloves and gives him the old shoulder shimmy. Come on, bud. He's like, oh, buddy. Because you know how this thing goes, right? <laughs> 14 seconds left. 14 of the match, not the round. Buddy, who's been getting his butt kicked the entire night, hanging on by a thread, Buddy still being cocky, he pops him with one, and all of a sudden comes around with the right hook. Right in the side of the head. Now, for some of you, are like, show us the clip. Show us the clip. And some of you are like, if you show us this clip, we'll never be back here ever again. <laughs> buddy, pow. And Buddy just open arms, falls back. Knocks him out with 14 seconds left in the match. And I'm watching, I'm like, Lord, if that's not a sermon, I don't know what is. Because there's a lot of Christians who are in a boxing match. And the interesting thing about these two guys is they both belonged in the ring. They were both 10-0, and 0, stellar boxers. But one guy started to get cocky. One guy got casual. One guy dropped his guard and put his hands down. And the other guy kept clawing, kept popping, kept jabbing, kept moving his feet, kept going, and then finally landed that right hook alongside old cocky boy's head. But I do wonder how many Christians in the capital C church get into the match called faith and they start high and tight and their hands are up and they're, they're kind of jabbing, they're doing their thing. And every once in a while they might even swing big, but then the longer they go with the Lord, the hands start coming down. And the fight doesn't seem so hard as when they first started. And the next thing you know, a few years in, they got their hands right down by their side. And they walk into the ring every day and their guards are down. They're not too worried. They're kind of calling like, I dare you. And all of a sudden, the enemy drops a right hook. Now the interesting thing was when the enemy drops a right hook, the right hook isn't the same for everybody because you're not all vulnerable in the same places in the same ways. Sometimes the enemy pops a right hook right into your marriage. Sometimes that right hook comes into your finances. Sometimes it comes into your thought life, your internet searches. Sometimes it comes in all these places, but it comes at us differently in different ways. Sometimes, and hang with me on this one, sometimes the enemy's right hook doesn't knock you out, it knocks you up. And what he does is he actually drives you into self-righteousness. And you start to believe, I'm not even in a fight anymore. I'm above the fight. Other people are in a battle, but not me. 
oh, you're maybe in the worst place. And so as I'm, as I'm reading this and processing this, we are in Ephesians chapter 6. We're in this idea of being in focus. And Buddy Boy dropped his hands and lost focus that he was in a boxing match. He forgot where he was, and his opponent reminded him. Ephesians chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, is, is this language just more poetically. It's the same idea that we're in a fight, except for Paul, when he says it, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his might. There's this idea, like as he's wrapping off his book, he's shifting gears. Uh, we did Ephesians 4 last week, but he's moving to the end of the book and he says, finally, like, I'm going to land the plane, I'm going to be done, but I want you to be strong in the Lord and his, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the, of the evil in the heavenly realms, heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up, take up the shield of faith for with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. He opens by saying, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. The call for the fight that we're in is not to be strong in a generic sense. It's not to be strong in a worldly sense. Paul is calling us to be strong in the strength that is appropriate for the battle that you're in. And so when he's saying be strong, it's not be strong as the world says be strong. Like, whatever you, however you came in tonight, your money is not going to help you in a spiritual battle. Your career is not going to help you in a spiritual battle. The house you live in or the car that you drive or the college that you went to or the posts you throw up on social media are not going to help you in a spiritual battle. That's not the kind of strength he's talking about. He says our strength is knowing who God is and knowing who we are in him. There's this idea in 1 Corinthians when Paul is saying that there is a, a strength and a folly. There's a foolishness and a wisdom to the world. And he says the world looks to these certain things, but we look to the cross, and the cross is, is foolishness to the world. But that God likes to take the foolish things to confound the wise things. He likes to take to the weak to confuse the powerful. Which means our spiritual strength is not seen with physical eyes. I think sometimes we come to the church and we look at the church like we look at the world, but the problem is the spiritually strong don't often look like worldly strong. And sometimes the spiritual giant walking amongst our church is the last person you'd think of. And the person that walks in with, with everything is spiritually weak and feeble. Our strength is not seen with physical eyes. Our spiritual strength is built in the unseen and in the quiet places. One of the things I fear that we tell ourselves is that when I'm in a battle, I'll prepare myself for the battle. If you prepare yourself for the battle when you're already in it, you've pretty much already lost it. See, the church is to prepare for the battle before it starts or before you even realize you're in it. There's this idea that we get ready no matter what. Our spiritual strength will not have a lid or a limit that makes sense to you. This was, a, I've preached this passage half a dozen times, and this thought was a brand new thought to me because he says, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I thought, well, that's interesting. 
if I'm getting stronger in the Lord's strength, if it's his strength that is strengthening me, then I shouldn't have lids and limits to that strength. Meaning, when I'm getting strong in the Lord, it is the God who spoke the world into existence. That kind of strength. It's the kind of strength that breathes life into creation. It's the kind of strength that breathes resurrection power into the tomb. And what we tend to do in the church, especially in the Canadian church, is we talk very weak and mild and appropriately, modestly. I mean, let's not be a fanatic. But the thing is, if you're being strong in the Lord's strength, the question becomes not how strong are you, but how strong is he? If you're tapping into his strength, the limits and the lids to be pulled off. And maybe our prayers would get a little bit bigger and our visions would get a little bit bigger and our belief would be a little bit higher because all of a sudden it's not on my back or your back, it's on his back. The second thing you see in this passage is that he says, you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Against the schemes. In other words, the schemes that he's hatching against you right now. The idea is, be ready. Be expecting. Expect a battle. It is coming. It is here. It is around you. You are in a battle. Like, it doesn't feel like a battle. That's my great fear. And sometimes what happens as Christians is that you come to church for a while, or you watch online, or you do this thing where you're kind of exploring faith, and you sign up, and you get baptized, and everyone's cheering for you, and everyone's excited, and you kind of go about your business, and it's great for a while. And then these trials start to come. Or some of the old addictions start to kind of clawing at you, trying to make their way back into your, the, the thought patterns and all these things. Like, well, I, I kind of thought when I became a Christian, everything would get better, but the subtext, what you mean to say is everything would get easier. And that's just not true. Everything will get better, but that is not synonymous with saying everything will get easier. You have an enemy who is working against you. You are in a battle. And so if you live by a false narrative, you'll be frustrated and confused all of your days. Like, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. I go to church. I'm involved in this, and I do these things. I can't. Why am I here? I have meetings with people sometimes. They'll even say, what am I doing wrong? And they're often shocked when I say to them, I don't think the question is, what are you doing wrong? The question is, what are you doing right? Do you know who the enemy doesn't attack? People who are sound asleep. The enemy puts his sights on people who are awake and on the move. And so when you start feeling this attack or this opposition or this, this force is rising up against you, the question is not what are you doing wrong, but what am I doing right? Why am I a threat to, the, to his kingdom all of a sudden? Because he's not happy with people who are on the move. And so the idea is not I'm shocked by a battle. What am I doing wrong by a battle? It's I'm in a battle. Paul David Tripp, in, in his book, Lead, uh, in his chapter on spiritual warfare, he said, it is amazing to me how many times the Bible normalizes what we dramatize. So we talk about spiritual battles and spiritual warfare, and either we think, oh, that's, not, that's not for here. I mean, that's, that's for, like, Africa. That's for Jamaica. That's for the countries where spiritual battles are happening. I mean, not here in North America. That's somewhere else. That's back in Bible times. That's for the charismatics. And so people don't want to bring up spiritual battles. And when they do, everybody else tells them they're weird or paranoid. Don't be so crazy. Don't be so weird. And the problem is the Bible is normalizing the spiritual battle. Page after page is just like you are not a physical being living a spiritual life. <clears throat> you are a spiritual being who happens to have a physical body. The spiritual is the normal. The spiritual is to be assumed. The spiritual is eternal. And yes, for a while we have this physical body and this physical realm, but you are spiritual beings in a spiritual battle. It is normal. And so when he says, wake up and put on the armor, and you're thinking, well, when do I put on the armor? Like, for the special days? For the days I'm going to have like a big spiritual battle? Paul would say, for every day. And it's amazing how many times even us pastors will pray more when we preach and pray less when we're on vacation. Like, wow, God, you helped me with that sermon last Thursday. I can take vacation. I got this one. Lord, you, you saw us through Christmas. 
I'll take a couple weeks. You have a vacation. I'm good. He says, armor up every day. Every day, wake up like today is a new day, which means a new battle, and I'm getting ready for it. I am putting on the armor. He continues and says, take up the whole armor. That we have to know our enemy. It's not just that we are to be strong. It's not just that we are to expect a battle. We're to know our enemy. It's, it's unfortunate how many times people are okay with talking about God in church, but not the devil. They're okay understanding, like, I want to know who God is. I want to know what Jesus is up to. I want to understand the Holy Spirit. But do we have to talk about, like, the, the, the devil? Like, Lucifer? Like, do we have to talk about that? Well, if you talk about this, why don't you talk about that? And so we leave that whole side of the conversation untouched. Or worse, we misapply enemy status to people who are not our enemy. And so we go home, and there's our spouse waiting for us. Like, ah, enemy number one. (laughs) And you tell yourself, if I had a different spouse, I'd have a different life. Well, that may be true, but it may not be a better life. And so we start telling ourselves, like, man, if that lazy slob would just get off the couch, if that woman would just take care of this, if that, they're not the enemy. Well, it's my kids, Pastor. You don't know my kids. No, but I know mine. (laughs) Our kids are not the enemy. Like, well, if I just had kids that behaved better. Well, if I just had, yeah, me too. They're not the enemy. Well, pastor, you don't know the job that I have. My boss is ridiculous. My coworkers are even worse than that, and the pay is pitiful. They're not your enemy. Well, if I had a better, and we just constantly move enemy status around to the physical, and he says, we are not waging war against flesh and blood. Your spouse is not your enemy. They may be your irritation, but not your enemy. <laughs> Amazing how many marriages get better, not when the spouse gets better, but when the spouse gets praying. And there's this idea of like, I just, I just want to fix them. Well, try praying for them. But I just want to fix them. Worry about yourself for a while. But I just want to fix them. No, no. We are in a spiritual battle, and so is your spouse. Early in our marriage, I mean, even Julie and I would be getting into something, we'd be getting frustrated and mad at each other, and we'd be like fighting with each other instead of realizing there's a spiritual battle in our home. How thrilled the enemy would be to rip down our marriage and rip down our home. How thrilled. Versus like, ah, you're not my enemy, you're not my opposition. I have one, and it's not you. The other question to ask yourself when you know your enemy is do you know your weaknesses? While the enemy is persistent, he's not often creative. Catch that one more time. While he's often persistent, he's not very creative. Which means, if I followed you around, I would know your weaknesses. If you followed me around, you would know my weaknesses. And so the question is not just what are his schemes, or how often is he prowling, or how often is he crouching at the door, but the other question you should ask yourself is, how often am I feeding him material? Like how often am I leaving the door open? How often am I inviting him in? You need to know what your weak spots are that he will pray against. Like, well, it's funny, Pastor, you, now that you say that, I find myself stumbling on the internet about 1 a.m. every day. Yeah, it's funny how coincidental that is. How pa- I, my thought life is always running away on me. The scripture says, take every thought captive. Well, I just find that every time I walk in the mall, I'm spending money on stuff I don't need. Stop walking in the mall. Well, but, but Amazon found me. <laughs> and it shows up in my Facebook feed. Then throw your computer in the trash. Like, well, that's ridiculous. So is wasting your money on junk you don't need. So the question is, which ridiculous do you want to be? It is a spiritual battle. It's like, ah, it's just a little spending. It's a spiritual battle. And so if we can find each other's weaknesses, guess what your enemy is doing? Shut the door. Like, well, I, how, how close can I get to the door, right? Why do we do this with sin? Like, well, I didn't, like, I didn't, like, go all the way over the edge. But you're so close that one moment of 
not focusing, you're going over the edge. Why not flee away? Know your weaknesses. Number four, he says, keep alert with all perseverance. Keep alert. Be focused. Be watching. Now, I, I, I played a lot of baseball growing up, and uh, I, I loved baseball. It was probably my favorite sport to play, and there was this theme that started in my life that lasted for years, and it was almost like, like the great tradition I was waiting for, and it kind of didn't, baseball season didn't start until this happened, and it, it, was, it went this way. Every first game of the year, when I went to the play, it was like, all right, new season. Don't get out. Start the season off right. Don't get out. Don't get out. Don't get out. Don't get out. And every stinking time, guess what happened? Strike out, pop out, struck down looking, picking my nose, whatever. Every stinking season. And I don't know how old I was before it dawned on me. Oh, I am getting exactly what I'm focused on. The whole time at the plate, don't get out, don't get out, don't get out, don't get out, got out. Maybe it should have been solid contact, solid contact, solid contact, solid contact. And there's this idea in Scripture where the Hebrews writer says, fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Like, but pastor, you just said we're in a spiritual battle. We are. Be alert, be armored up, and be ready, and fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. But I don't know where he's going to come from. Fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Because the thing with the spiritual battle, and this is the best word I can tell you, is you're not in the ring alone. See, Buddy Boy, who got in the fight, he was just kind of doing his own thing one-on-one. And I pictured myself in the boxing ring. <clears throat> Excuse me. I pictured myself in there throwing, throwing punches. And I pictured myself getting pummeled, to be honest. <laughs> I feel like I have no business being in a boxing ring. But then I pictured a third person in the ring. And the minute I'm taking the pummeling, I picture the heavyweight coming over and knocking the guy off his feet. Rising up and just leveling him. See, because where the boxing illustration breaks down is it's not just one-on-one. It's two-on-one. And if you keep fixing your eyes on Oh, I better not go on the internet too late at night. You better not go on the internet. Ooh, better stay off the internet. Stay off the internet. You will be on the internet. Don't eat that food. Don't eat that food. Don't eat that food. Don't eat that food. Not that ice cream. Not with that hot fudge. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're eating it. I guarantee it. Oh, don't think about... Th- don't think... Don't... Don't... We fix our eyes on the thing that we're not supposed to walk into. And you will go where you're looking. And so he says, persevere, be ready, be attentive, but be attentive on Jesus. Invite him into the ring. And some of you are going it alone. You're just kind of throwing haymakers for all you're worth, and you're exhausted, and you hear Mick in the corner, don't give up, Rocky, you hear it all. <laughs> and the problem is, you're like, I won't give up. But our guy in the corner wants to get in and fight with us and for us. And some of you need tonight, I don't know where you're all coming from tonight, but some of you need to wake up to the reality that you're in a fight because you're walking around like this spiritually. Just another Tuesday, just another Thursday. And you're like, why am I getting getting hammered all week long? Because your guard's down. Wake up. Wake up and pray for your marriage. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your kids. Get on your physical knees if you have to. Duct tape reminders to your spouse's forehead to pray for them. I don't care what you do. You're in a battle. Wake up. Some of you need to armor up. Because you're just kind of flailing about. (laughs) You're in a cat fight for all you're worth. Armor up. Get into the word. Bolster your faith. Start to pray. Put on the breastplate. Get the shield up. Be ready because you're in a battle. Armor up for the day. And some of you, please hear me, some of you need to be bold enough to claim a victory. Like, well, it's not over. I know it's not over, but I know how it's going to be over. 
And part of the problem is some of you are walking around your battle saying, well, I'm a loser. Well, I'm a loser. I'm a loser. I lost yesterday and I'll probably lose today. Your yesterday does not predict your tomorrow. And so you may have lost yesterday, but there might be a victory waiting for you tomorrow. Not because you're great, but because he is. Persevere. Wake up and armor up. Say, God, there is a victory coming. God, I am asking you to fight for me. I am asking for you to defend me. I am asking for you to defend my spouse and my kids. Protect them. Watch over them. God, I'm going to battle, and I see what you're going to do for me. I believe it, and I'm waiting for it. falls, it won't prevail, cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph, my God will never fail, yeah, my God will never fail, I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory The battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory The battle belongs to you And 
take a moment to pray together church I don't know if you know this being seated is not much of a start for a fighting position would you stand with me please let's pray Heavenly Father you are that heavyweight and you are calling us back to yourself you are calling us to lean on you you are calling us to fight in your strength, and we pray that you would give us discipline and wisdom to do so starting tonight. Lord, I believe you could identify with the love and the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit in each one of our lives what it is that you would have us focus on in this fight. It might be something we are aware of right now. It might be something you hit us with uh, on the drive home. Whenever it is, God, there will be a decisive moment of whether we are going to go with you or still try to do things on our own. Whether we are going to acknowledge we're in a battle or if we would rather just kind of tuck it in the drawer and forget the idea altogether. I pray, Lord, that in that decisive moment, you will help us to choose to fight with you. Help us to choose to believe that you are for us. And I think a lot of us have spent a lot of time in our lives realizing we're in a battle and just letting ourselves succumb to it because we failed, because we have regrets, because there are so many ways that we have not lived up to what we hoped we, hoped we could do. Jesus, you died on the cross to redeem us. You rose to new life to set us free. Help us to claim that freedom. Help us to claim that victory and to lean on you. So God, let this not be a good message that goes by the wayside and we think, yeah, that had good information, yeah, that had good ideas, let us act. You're calling us to act, you're calling us to fight. Jesus, equip us, push us when we need it, and help us to respond for the good of us as individuals, for the good of our families, for the good of our workplaces, for the good of our community. You are doing good things, but it's not always just what we see. Often it's what we can't see. Help us to believe that that matters just as much and to follow you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your love. And thank you for victory. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Now you can go ahead and have a seat. Really glad that you've been able to join us for church. And uh, whether you're in the room or watching online, one of the things I love about this series is that it is called In Focus. And if you are focusing on something, that means it's right in front of you. I would encourage you, church, to let this word linger. Let it be something that you roll over in your minds. Maybe you need to go and watch this sermon again in a little bit, in either tonight or whenever it might be uh, at your availability to do so. But let it be something that you think about because God will direct you to one or two things where you need to stand up and fight. It will be worth it because he is in it and he is good. God bless you as you go. We love you, church. Have a great week.